Hello, and thank you for joining me for another Meet Our Partners chat. Today, I have Alvin Keen joining me, one of the esteemed instructors for the Building and Leading Resilient Teams Certificate Program at Georgia Southern University. He has over 20 years of project management, planning, and development experience, and is a veteran of the U.S. Army. Alvin, thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome, Belinda. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> Absolutely. So I always like to start these conversations off by, you know, asking my guests to tell me a little bit about themselves, their professional background, and also the work that you're doing right now with Georgia Southern. All right. Well, thank you. So uh, I'm originally from Southern California. So I, you know, presently <laughs> live in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, my first career was with uh, the Boeing Company on commercial military space programs. So I was on the C-17 program. Did a lot of great things on uh, project management, finance, supply chain, Lean Six Sigma, helping to be that uh, change agent and really got involved with them and then um, moved from there to the, uh, well, at the same time I had that, I had my uh, military career going on. Uh, so I retired as a lieutenant colonel um, four years ago after 34 years. My final tours were in the acquisition core as a project uh, program manager and contract officer, uh, really loved it. You know, be all you can be was the best army slogan and they had, they finally brought it back. It was just so empowering and inspiring. And then uh, I was in oil and gas as a commercial manager, or risk manager for several years. And um, now I'm in the defense sector doing uh, the program manager in um, supply chain and network development. And then I'm an adjunct uh, instructor teaching project management as well. Wow. So you're busy. Lots of different leadership and just um, formal and I'm sure informal business um, experience that people get to lean on and learn from uh-huh. once they uh-huh. take you, you take the course with you. Mm-hmm. So and I've been with RBLP, uh, been affiliated with them doing it for four years since January yeah. 2020. Oh, by the way, and I've done all, I've worked with all clients of the Department of Defense. And I was actually the instructor selected to do the pilot program for the Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, we worked uh, with them and got four of their people through. That was a pilot one. And then they selected to do our BLP after that. That's awesome. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm actually Canadian born. So, you know, hearing about you giving instruction to the Canadian Armed Forces, it's it's near and dear to my personal heart. <laughs> yeah, a small world. It really is. It really is. Yeah. So I think you'll have a very, very interesting answer to this because of all of your experience. What would you say is your personal leadership philosophy? Well, first of all, I, I, leadership is a contact sport, means you have to work with through people. So you can't be the leader in the pinnacle and just, you know, avoiding everybody. So I'm much more of a, hey, how do we help build the team? I'm in the, or, you know, I think that's from the military being an officer. You know, the officer eats last. If there's anything left over, you leave from the front. You you take the initiative. You really try to help develop. You are, you are replaceable and helping making sure that the team is uh, pl- uh, trained, developed, and can execute. And the same thing in the civilian life, you know, being a leader that's involved, helping the team, growing the team. Uh, some of my greatest challenges have been where I've taken over teams that were struggling, you mm-hmm. know, because I, I often felt like, well, it's got nowhere to go but up. And it'll really show my uh, leadership skills, being able to turn them around and help the team contribute and feel better and produce Absolutely. more. So. Yeah, I think that's a really great way to mention it or to describe it, you know, that it's a contact sport. I was speaking mm-hmm. to someone earlier today and he talked about how he joined a team and most of the people he was overseeing, he was new, relatively new to the company mm-hmm. and everyone he was overseeing had been with the company for probably 15 plus years. And so he took the time to job shadow each of the people on his mm-hmm. team for an entire shift, including a couple couple of them that did a graveyard shift and it really you know that when you say that that is is what I think Mm -hmm. the embodiment of contact sport get in with your people understand you know understand what they're going through so I like that and also Mm -hmm. I immediately thought of football get your pads on and get ready to rumble (laughs) very true so um in your opinion what would you say is the value of specifically building and leading resilient teams 
Uh, I think resilient teams, especially in today's environment, that all, all industries are under tremendous pressure and people and their professional skills as well. So it is not I I have only one thing and I know one thing. No, no, no. I have to learn to do more. I have to grow. I have to do more lateral moves. So I've got to be much more adaptive. I have to be able to work in situations I may not know. So I have to be, can I uh, learn how to do it? Can I be much more resilient in, uh, okay, this is not that bad and I'm going to learn something new and I'm going to you know grow and meet some other new team members. And uh, uh, I think that just gives them people more, puts people more empowering to their own career development. How can I expand my own skill through resiliency? I can, you know, I can grow, I can develop, I can volunteer, I can, you know, take on things that nobody wants to do, you know. And I think that a lot of people are looking for that. And I think it's great that you mentioned that where it's how can I, it, it's people don't just want to be told what to do. Well, that mm-hmm. is helpful, especially mm-hmm. in the beginning. People right. want to feel like I have some control over, mm-hmm. you know, how it is that I grow within my career and how I make an impact on the team that I'm on. Mm-hmm. So one of our competency domains is create a positive climate, as you know, is one of our great instructors. Uh, What role would you say building a positive climate has played in how you've led teams in the past, but also looking into the future of how people build teams as well? Well, I think as a, and I've taken over some really challenging, (laughs) failing teams, and sometimes I might have been only the more positive person initially on the team, but I kept thinking, okay, you know, it's and me coming in. Uh, I'm naturally a very positive, optimistic person. You'll probably get that impression. So I'm like, you know, hey, it's okay. It's not that bad. You know, it can't go any lower. So let's see what we can do to improve. And I think that um, helping a team as a leader, especially to people are looking to you to see if you come in there and say, wow, this is all messed up, you know, well, you know, well, very negative, that can be very, uh, has a multiplying effect as equally as if I come in very positive, you know, and I can be much more uh, influencing people say, well, you know, we're going to learn, yes, yeah, a challenge, we can grow, you know, here's what we need to solve, but, uh, you know, help people to see that we can, uh, we can have, make a path to go forward. It may not be easy, but we can move forward. It's that, that idea that sometimes, you don't have to steer, see the staircase. You just need to see the next step. And it sounds to me like you come in and you're like, listen, it's a long staircase. What I can do for you right now is help reveal that next step and allow you to take that next step up towards where we're trying to go. I had a counselor in college when I was talking about all the hard classes in the senior level. And she goes, if you don't pass these classes, you don't have to worry about those. <laughs> and I always thought, right, she goes, yeah. focus on this. And then yeah. you can take, move on to the other. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, so another one of our domains is developing cohesion. How <clears throat> have you been able to reflect and see how developing cohesion as you know, taught in the training has helped in how you've developed teams in the past, but also how people, like I said before, are building the teams in the climate that um, that people are having to work with and in today? That's a great question, because especially now on international teams, uh, Mm -hmm. I got to go to Europe several months, uh, several trips, and working with a different culture, you have to, you can't come over and say, well, here, I got all the solutions. No, 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 I I need to work with you. And that was, I I think I grew a lot, especially working with international team members, getting that, uh, building that common cultural understanding uh, learning about them, their, you know, their perspectives, you know, their history, architectural backgrounds, especially I, I really enjoyed those because mm-hmm. I, you know, then you get to that, then you're really connecting. And then it's, um, but I always felt that the international teams I worked on were the best on a growing culture, you know, and so even like even the U.S., you because we have different sort of regional cultural differences, you know, I know mm-hmm. when I moved from um, California to Houston, uh, Houston that was like a a little microculture shock. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, I think getting, you know, bridging the uh, interaction with other cultural and backgrounds helps the uh, team cohesion come a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, inside. So what would you say are some of the best ways to help promote cohesion on a team um, so that people can not just respect the differences or the different ways of thinking that everyone has, but appreciate it and then ultimately be able to leverage it? Well, I think having worked with a lot of teams, I've always tried to do, um, 
here's like one thing I do on all the teams I try to be on and uh, I've worked with or led or coached is especially if they're starting new, I always ask them, let's everybody write down a couple of things that you've been on great team. And you say, everybody's got their, here's my top two or three great team characteristics. And then I, I say, you know what? We all know what a great team has been felt like. So now these are our, our traits that we're trying to develop mm. at the beginning. And I find that that helps get alignment of, you know, I know what a great team feels like and you know what a great mm. team feels like. So now we both can have a common uh, development going forward to make the team that we're on currently the best team. Yeah, that that reminds me of what you said earlier about in making people feel empowered and that realization is like oh all hope isn't lost i've seen this if i've seen it once i can create it or i can see it again or at least something you know maybe even better than what i'd ever seen before so um you know providing purpose mm-hmm. is another competency competency domain of ours and so how have you found helping people find their individual purpose as well as the team purpose? How has that been helpful in your ability to lead teams and help build the team resilient environment? Good. Uh, purpose it, Purpose answers the, the what and why we're doing it. Mm. You've got to be able to help people understand what and why. Mm-hmm. We're making this widget. We're going to be the best widget team or we're going to do whatever. People can identify that because then they can get that sense of uh, identity and connectivity. Got to keep people on the what and the why. Yeah. And then it's it sounds to me like it becomes that North Star. When you want to give up, mm-hmm. it's, you know, maybe you're not focusing on the what and the why. And it's like, mm-hmm. all right, let's shift our focus. You're looking at the, you know, the ugly stuff over there. Shift over here where it's a little mm-hmm. bit bright and brighter and aspirational. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as one of our you know, an instructor with one of our authorized education partners. So for those who aren't familiar, you'd get the training mm-hmm. with our with our friend Alvin here. But then we are the credentialing body. We're the body where you come and take an oral exam for one of our three levels of certification. And um, and so the question I always like to ask our instructors with our education partners is, what would you say is the purpose of after getting really great training you know, with you, why should they go forward and, you know, sit for an exam so they can earn the four letters that they can put behind their name? Well, I really believe in credentials. And if you look at my uh, resume, I, I, being a lifelong learner, it's like, okay, I think credential, the, the value of a credential is one, it distinguishes at least between you and somebody else, you have it, they don't, or they have it and you don't. It's an easy way initially think, Firms can filter out RBLP or any other credentials, IT credentials or, you know, uh, project management credential. Secondly, it keeps you current with, okay, here's some new current knowledge models I'm learning. Because, you know, as you know, dealing with people, models and theories are still evolving. Because guess what? People are changing. The nature of work is changing. The work-life balance topics is changing. And then I think a third area is you make connections. You make networks. I mean, I've worked with some great, I've worked with uh, close to 70 clients, and I feel like I've got 70 friends or colleagues I can reach out on a variety of, hey, how are you doing, what you're doing? Uh, I've even met people, they are changing or, you know, traveling somewhere. We've met for lunch, you know, if they're coming in here or, you know, so I think you just get a great networking as well connection. And then I think you're staying current and, you know, you're like, okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that, you know, tapping into just being part of a community, right? Mm-hmm. And it's about more than just the seven weeks of training or however long you end up taking the training or just the personal relationship with the instructor. It, it, it's something greater than that and bigger than that. Mm-hmm. And certifying allows you to do that. So we've come to my favorite question Good. out of these interviews. And I always love this question because everyone's answer is different. And I, and I, and I think everyone who watches learns a lot. So are you ready? Yes, ma'am. All right. So what would you say is the most important lesson you learned from a leader that you most admired? And then what would you say is the most important lesson that you learned from a leader that you weren't particularly fond of? So the person I most admired doesn't have to be somebody I actually worked with, but maybe read about. Yeah. That's fine. Good. The lessons applicable always. <laughs> always good, good. Um, the person that I admire as a leader is really uh, General of the Army George Marshall. 
not from his military stuff, but from what he really did as a and he was a very good leader in the, as far as the army, uh, an excellent leader. But his real leadership was a transformational leader. If you go back and really read, I, I don't think a lot of people really study him. Uh, he was very instrumental uh, as a colonel and uh, early in his mid career in influencing other young leaders, because uh, this was during the war period. And he started making changes. Uh, about how to uh, the education, the army officers, the curriculum, and he started changing things. And as he rose up through the ranks, and at the time that he was the um, uh, chief of staff of the army, he really knew up and coming by that time, World War II was going, starting, and he really started changing the leader. He mm -hmm. recognized people that who were. Uh, more adaptive, more uh, robust in their leadership skills. He started to get, you know, bypass leaders that were just, you know, I, I've been here the longest, so I should move up next, you know. And um, and he really implemented a lot of things and behind the scenes to change how the leadership of the American Army was ready for World War II. Yeah, really now, ushered in a new because, way huh? of leadership, usher, ushered in a new way of leadership. Yeah, he really in a changed profound time. the um, the approach to how to evaluate leaders, and he would bypass leaders to pick out the better leader for whatever their mm. skills, capabilities, and experience. Not because somebody was just there for longevity purposes, and he shook up the. So I think that's what a transformational leader does. Mm -hmm. You change the foundation. You start to change the culture. He had a longer term view. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just I've got to worry about this year. I, I'm really developing the change culture, the foundation of how, and uh, so I think that's why, and I think that's what a lot of civilian business leaders, but more successful ones really worry about the foundation and the culture versus the, I'm here for, you know, a year or two or three, and then, you know. And what about the leader that you learned the most from with whom you weren't particularly fond of? What was that lesson that you learned from or through them? You know, we often learn more about how to not be a leader from the negative <laughs> leadership skills. And I, I think as a, a young leader in aerospace, my early career, I remember a gentleman who was very knowledgeable, but very abrasive. And he tend to be more of a intimidating leader. Like he, you know, he was very knowledgeable, but nobody could approach him. And he, but he, you know, it was like he had these implied, everybody should know what how to do because I've already done it. And you know, but and he just really never had the patience as a leader to work with people. And um, and I got to know him a little bit more and told him one day, I said, you know, people really want to learn from you, but they're afraid of you because you, you're, un you're, you're unapproachable. But I wasn't directly under his leadership skills or his uh, reporting chain. So I felt like I could just, you know, I, I, I don't really work for you. I'm on a team with you. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what a gift to the gift of honesty, right? Where a lot of people were too afraid to give him the truth. And maybe, you know, obviously I don't know what happened. He might not have been receptive in the moment. People yeah. always hear. And when when he was ready, that message, I'm sure he's like, hmm. I think that's where, you know, you have to figure, you learn something from positive leaders. And sometimes you learn more from the negative leaders. About how about not to be a leader? Absolutely. Absolutely. I live I live vicariously through others. I'm like, oh, okay. So you tried to try that, didn't work. I'm good. I don't need to try. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll observe from your failures or your uh. Okay, that's clearly not the approach. I agree. I agree on that too. And I think that's one aspect of a leader is well, you have to be very observant. People mm -hmm. give signals. If you're a leader, you're attuned to it. But otherwise, a lot of people, I never see the problems if I'm not looking at the people. I think it's goes beyond just you know leadership it's in life if you take the time to just really pay attention and not just it needs to be right in front of your face for you to see it you'll you'll learn more than you ever think you could so mm -hmm. well Alvin I so appreciate your time today you have you know confirmed why this these are one of my favorite things to do I always learn so much and I really appreciate you sharing everything with me today great okay so thank you for that uh, let me know how I can help you and appreciate it. And if you want to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm on there. So let's see what we can do. Okay. Absolutely. And to you who's watching, thank you so much for your time. Until next time, I'll see you later. Bye. All right. Thank you.